So um, let me uh, begin by introducing um, our presenter, Tom Bree. Um, he has been uh, with the Prince's Foundation School of Traditional Arts since 2001. He graduated with his MA in 2003, and since then has been involved in um, teaching with us on our outreach and open programs, and he also is a tutor on the MA program. We invited him to speak as part of um, this Mental Health Awareness Week, um, because the, week, the week's theme is nature, and Tom's course, um, Geometry and the Order of Nature, um, is one that is very popular with us at the school. Um, and uh, the feedback that we've had in the last year with our online classes has been that the sitting down and drawing geometry and looking deeply at the principles of nature has been very calming and uh, centering for people in lockdown. And we wanted to share that with you that today. Um, I'm just checking to make sure that the live broadcast is in fact working. Um, Rasha, can you confirm that for, for me? Yes. Okay, so um, with that, um, over to you, Tom, and we'll start again at the beginning. Apologies, everyone, thanks. Welcome everyone, welcome uh, to this session. Now, I don't know if uh, um, any of you saw what I was saying a few minutes ago when I think we uh, assumed we were live streaming. So if you did, then you may get a few repeats with what I'm about to show you. Now in today's session, we're going to do some, some very simple symmetries. Um, we're not gonna do anything too complex because we're only here for a, a bit under an hour now. Um, but we're going to look at some of the symmetries that you find in the world of flowers. Now, when we look at the world of growth, we see number manifesting forth uh, in geometric form. But interestingly, when you go further beyond uh, planet Earth, you still see the same sorts of symmetries uh, occurring at larger scale. Now, of course, if you go down to a very small scale as well, you see these same symmetries. So there's this harmonious order that pervades the whole cosmos. Now we're going to concentrate on how they show themselves within uh, the world of flowers first off. So I'll begin uh, with some slides. Now, I suppose an important point to make here in relation to this idea of there being uh, an all pervasive order within the cosmos is that uh, if we're uh, remembering that order through drawing it, then we're aligning ourselves with it. So you could say that we're going, I suppose, going with the flow of things, going with the natural flow of things. And there is something very relaxing and integrating about that. And so I suppose it's a, a good thing to be talking about uh, the practice of geometry in relation to mental health, because mental health is often associated with, I suppose, or lack of mental health with moving away from a, a natural uh, way of things, uh, a harmonious way of living. Now, if we take a look at this bougainvillea flower here, um, it just naturally comes forth with its triangular shape. And you can see there's a small five-fold bud at the center. Now, these flowers, they just spring forth and they bring forth these beautiful symmetries. Uh, we obviously need to have compasses and straight edge to actually bring these patterns forth. But these flowers, they, they, they just know, I suppose they have this inherent knowledge of the particular symmetry that they're bringing forth. Now, here's another example uh, of threeness. Now, as you can see, this uh, threeness or triangularity is showing itself really in a very different way uh, to the previous image. Uh, the petals are a completely different shape um, and the coloring, of course, is completely different, but we still see uh, the same uh, triangularity within it. So there's an underlying numerical order, uh, which is there, which is the same in both images, but the way in which that numerical order shows itself uh, outwardly in the actual outward forms is different from one to another. And this is really such an important aspect of nature. Uh, nature is not something where you find uniformity. It's where there's a huge amount of differences that together relate as one overarching unity. So in a certain sense, there's one, but in another sense, there's an enormous uh, multiplicity. This is the case of uh, a passion fruit, and you can see how this also has 
uh, well, a dual threefold symmetry. So threefold symmetry going uh, in two different uh, ways at the same time. So essentially moving into six. Some flowers, as you can see, such as this one, are fourfold. Uh, most flowers are actually fivefold, but um, this one and uh, one like this uh, has um, the fourfold symmetry. Um, flowers that are fourfold and fivefold generally come from uh, dicotyledon seeds, which um, are seeds that are sort of dual, um, whereas uh, threefold and sixfold flowers, they uh, come forth from monocotyledon seeds. So the type of seed actually determines the symmetry of the flower right from the, the very beginning. Now this is a hollyhock uh, with the sun shining through it. So you can very clearly see the pentagram star uh, that it has uh, within its form. Now, as I mentioned a little earlier, the vast majority of flowers uh, are based on five uh, or tenfold symmetry, uh, symmetry that has the golden ratio within it. Uh, the golden ratio is a particular mathematical ratio that uh, you find very much so in the world of growth. And when it shows itself uh, through the geometry of a circle, it naturally divides the circle into five and 10. Now, again, here's an example of sameness and difference. The fiveness is there, but the way in which it shows itself in the outward form is totally different in comparison to the image of the hollyhock that we were just looking at. Now, we, uh, we eat these symmetries as well. And of course, the body that does the eating, uh, we are fivefold in a sense. I mean, our DNA spiral, the cross section of it is a 10 pointed star. Uh, the average strawberry, as you can see, um, it has that green uh, pentagram star, uh, as you can see there, which is pointing upwards. And then there's an interposed, more sort of curved floral uh, five pointed star as well. Now, this flower is a really wonderful uh, metaphor for mental health and uh, uh, integration. Uh, this one opens up, first of all, through being a pentagon, as you can see it here, and then it opens up fully as a, a decagon, the ten-sided polygon. Now this, as you may be aware, is a morning glory flower, and it opens up in the morning to receive the light of the sun. And then in the evening it closes up again. So it has this really healthy um, balance, I suppose you could say, between looking outwards and receiving the light, but also looking inwards and uh, being, I suppose, in a state of sleep or a state of inwardness. Now, maybe you've noticed or maybe not. Uh, often people say that they aren't aware of all of the geometry in nature until they come to one of these classes. Um, but daffodils, they have this Star of David shape about them. You know, the Star of David is the six-pointed star uh, as understood in the Jewish tradition. Um, it's known as the Seal of Solomon uh, in the Islamic tradition uh, or the Satkona Yantra in uh, the Tantric tradition in India. Um, it goes under various names, but uh, in all cases, it's two triangles, one pointing up and one pointing down. Now, a uh, symbolism that's often associated with this particular star is the joining uh, of opposites. And so, of course, this is another very key idea when it comes to mental health, uh, dealing with uh, polarities in conflict, whether it's uh, conflict on the outside or conflict on the inside, it's important uh, for all things to become integrated uh, and unified, uh, all the differences uh, recognizing their overarching unity. Now in uh, these six-fold flowers, they're generally understood to have three petals and three sepals, but the three sepals look very petal-like, so it comes over really as being a six-fold flower. 
Uh, the sepals are the outer casing of the flower. Now this particular flower will see uh, a geometric form virtually identical to this when we uh, draw a six-fold symmetry. Now in case you hadn't noticed, um, every single snowflake is the same because they're all six-fold. But of course, as we know, every single snowflake is also completely unique in terms of how it uh, brings forth that six-fold symmetry. Um, but sixness is what naturally happens when water freezes, the six-fold symmetry comes forth. Now, hopefully the other thing that perhaps you're just recognizing whether consciously or not is that all of these images that I'm showing you are beautiful and beauty is just such an important a thing to recognize for happiness. Um, in many different religious traditions, beauty is uh, a divine attribute. So beauty has an effect on us uh, inwardly. It's not just some outward appearance of something. It actually perhaps uh, awakens uh, a beauty within us. Now, staying with six-fold symmetry, as we were looking at in the snowflakes and in the flowers, here we have another uh, hexagonal shape. Now, you can see that hexagon there. It's got sort of rounded corners, but it is very clearly uh, a six-fold shape. Now, this is absolutely, well, huge. It's astronomically uh, big. You could fit a few planet Earths into this hexagon. This is actually the north pole of uh, planet Saturn. So here's a... a slightly more beautiful image of it. If you look at the dark area at the center of the planet there, uh, you can see, if you look closely, that it's a uh, hexagonal shape. There's a hexagonal uh, atmospheric formation that goes around the North Pole of Saturn. So just in case you are under the impression that these geometric symmetries only happen at human scale, or perhaps at very small scale, like a snowflake, they're also happening at uh, enormous scale as well. The same all pervasive order uh, within cosmos. Now this is another cosmological diagram. This is from the work of John Martineau, who's another um, ex-student from the Prince's Foundation School of Traditional Arts. Now what John did was to get uh, NASA's uh, figures and measurements for um, planetary sizes and uh, distances and sizes of mean orbital circles. And he demonstrated that they work according to geometric principles. Now, this may at first seem a bit fantastical and overly amazing, but why would geometry stop working once we leave the surface of planet Earth? It just makes complete sense. Uh, when we think about what's going on in the cosmos, it's lots of spheres moving in circular motions around larger spheres and working their way into spiral shaped galaxies. So we live in a very geometrically ordered cosmos. Of course, forever dynamic and ever changing, but uh, never chaotic, it's always ordered. If we have lots of spheres and circular movements, how can there be suddenly some random chaos within that? There's clearly an ordering principle at work. Now, what happens in this image, you can see how there's a, a nesting of six pointed stars. So there's a larger six pointed star and then one inside that and then a third one again inside that. And you can see how the two circles are interacting with that nesting of shapes. Now the smaller circle in uh, the middle, uh, that if we say that that is the orbital circle, the mean orbital circle of planet Earth, then the mean orbital circle uh, of Jupiter will be that outer one. So that particular geometric relationship uh, can be said to govern that uh, relationship of distance between those two orbital circles. Um, the book this is from is called The Little Book of Coincidence or Little Book of Coincidences. It's uh, well worth getting, just a small book.
Now, of course, if we're looking for geometry in our surroundings, I mean, we can't obviously see this in our day-to-day -day life, but we need to look no further than the sphere uh, on which we live. And of course, as I just said, these spheres, they're moving around larger spheres, which themselves are forming into spiral shaped galaxies. And so it's called cosmos for a reason. Cosmos, the Greek word for order and adornment. Now I'm going to stop sharing uh, the screen and uh, we can start doing uh, some drawing. So I assume that you're at the ready with uh, a pair of compasses, uh, a pencil and uh, a straight edge of some sort. A ruler is of course fine and we'll, we'll just use the, the measurement markings at the very, very beginning. But the way we do geometry at the Prince's School is uh, just really with compasses and straight edge. So we begin with a particular size of circle and then we get our measurements from within the diagram itself rather than from the measurements on the, on the ruler. Now I'm going to switch to my uh, drawing camera. And now you can see uh, the paper that I'll be drawing onto. Now, first of all, on your compasses, get a, a radial measurement of, um, yeah, about three centimeters or one and a quarter inches if you're working in Imperial. Now come down about, um, I don't know, seven, seven centimeters, I think, which is probably about, it's about two and three quarter inches. Yeah, have your compasses down about seven centimeters with that radial measurement that I gave you. And what I'm gonna do is draw a circle, which will obviously stay on the page like so. Up in the top left hand corner of the page. We're going to draw various things over the page here. So I'm just going to begin with the first exercise here. Now the first thing that we see with uh, a circle is its uh, equality in all directions. Uh, every single part of the circumference is equidistant from uh, the central point. So it's in this ideal balance. Uh, the center, of course, is equidistant between all uh, opposing points on the circumference. So you could say that the center is, in a sense, uh, the peacemaker. It's the one that's at the center of everything. And of course, Lisa earlier on talked about uh, centering. And so that in itself, obviously, is using the idea of a circle uh, as something to describe something that we're experiencing inwardly. Now, the other thing about the circle is that uh, it could be said to embody uh, a threeness, as well as embodying the unity of uh, equidistance of all the circumference from the centre. Uh, there's also a threeness in the terms of there being the centre, the circumference, and then importantly, the relationship between those two. Now, this really is such a key thing when it comes to any notion of mental health. It's to do with recognizing uh, the relationship between things rather than things being separate or uh, in some sort of antagonistic conflict, there needs to be uh, a relationship. And in that sense, there is the reestablishment of an overarching uh, unity or oneness, even though those things that are in that unity are separate uh, and distinct. They're nonetheless recognizing how they fit together as one. Now with this in mind, I want us to draw a second circle uh, from here. So from the right hand side of the circle. So carefully place the point 
of your compasses in there and draw a second circle and you should hopefully find that your pencil goes through the center of your original circle like so. Now this con particular configuration of circles, uh, it creates uh, an overlap. This is sometimes known as uh, a vesica Pisces or uh, a mandola is uh, another word. That's the Italian word for almond. And it has an association with uh, the mediating relationship between opposites. So what I was just describing there in relation to uh, the relationship between center and circumference being the radius uh, in this particular instance, uh, the mediating relationship is the overlap of these two circles. And it has a symbolic association with uh, a doorway. And so, of course, a doorway is the thing that allows passage between two sides. And so where uh, two sides are able to be in uh, relationship with one another. Now, in Christian iconography, you often see Christ depicted in this image. And so then from a perspective of Christian ideas, that relates to the idea that Christ is both divine and human at the same time. So the reconciliation of opposites. Now, moving on from here, I'm gonna put in a third circle from this point here where the two circles overlap. Now, as you can see, we now have a threefold symmetry. We've got this shape in the middle, which I suppose you could say is like a, an inflated triangle. And then on each side of it, you have these floral petal shapes uh, showing themselves. And then beyond that, the rest of each circle. So we've moved into threeness, uh, like that bougainvillea flower that I showed you at the beginning. And let's just do a very simple marking out of uh, this threefold symmetry. Now I'm going to put my ruler between this point and this point, but you should find that your ruler also naturally goes through that point as well. And we can do that uh, in all three of the positions where it's possible to do so. And there we have the shape of the bougainvillea flower. I'm going to actually also nest another triangle inside, seeing as we have the points to be able to do so. Now, of course, I used a, a geometrically appropriate point to do that. This, of course, is the halfway point between the two ends of the triangle's edge. Uh, if we were to look upon this in musical terms, so if you had a musical string, let's say this was a musical string, then there is a significant note that happens at the center of the string. So these very simple basic symmetries, they happen uh, musically as well in terms of the dividing of a string or the placing of uh, holes on a tube in a, a wind instrument. So it's these harmonious, very simple harmonious divisions which bring about these ideal beautiful forms. Now let's move on to one that has a bit more going on in it. Um, I'll just decide which measurement I want you to do again. Um, let's do the same measurements. Yeah, same measurements again. So keep your radial measurement as it was. Um, just in case you need a reminder. Yeah, so that's, yeah, three centimeters, one and a quarter inches. Now this first circle that you need to draw here. Again, let's have it um, seven centimeters down from the top of the page, which is, um, that's two and three quarter inches from the top of the page.
And we're going to move into fourfold symmetry with this drawing. So uh, a slight difference in approach is required uh, in the sense that we're going to need uh, a ruler in the stage of construction. So not just for drawing uh, something afterwards, uh, but we're going to need it at this point to go through the circle with a line. Now this time I'm going to go onto the right hand side of the circle and put another one in so that we have something very similar to how we started over here. But this time I'm also going to put one on here as well. So this um, threefoldness that I've been talking about in terms of two things and their relationship can still be seen, but uh, obviously in a different way this time in relation to uh, the central area that's shared as well as the two distinct identities in the two uh, different circles. Now from here, we're going to move into fourfoldness. So I'm gonna place the point of my compasses here at the top of this vesica shape. And I'm going to draw a petal like shape like so. And then I'm gonna do the equivalent thing turned around the other way. So in this point, And then I'm going to repeat that same move. Having, having used those two points, I'm now going to use these two points here. And I'm going to repeat that move down here below. Now you may notice when um, I put the point of the compasses in, I very carefully place it to make sure it goes to exactly the right place and then draw. Now, sometimes people place it with their non-drawing hand. So place it with the left hand and draw with the right hand or obviously vice versa if you're left-handed. Um, but it's fine to place it with the hand you're drawing with as well, whichever feels most comfortable. Now, having put in these two petal shapes, what we now have in relation to the tips of the petal. Now, this is quite an important thing. Make sure that you have the tips of the petal. So if when you drew these lines, they didn't quite meet, go back to those two points uh, or those two points so as to make sure that you can extend those curves a bit to make sure they meet because we need them so that we can do this. Now, the next thing that I'm going to do is place the point of the compasses there, because having put in the vertical line, we've now established, you could say, the north and the south points of the circle. We started off with the east and the west points with that line, but we now have this line here, so we can put in another circle like so. And then of course, I'm gonna do the equivalent thing from the Southern point of the circle. Now I'm gonna do something similar to these petals here. Uh, in these areas too. So using these two points, uh, 
And as you can see, this is repeating what we do. I'm actually going to go all the way into the center. I'm going to do slightly more. I'm going to extend these outer petals. So having gone from there, I've done the whole of this. From the center of the whole diagram up to here. And then I'm going to do the equivalent move here. And once you've done that here, then do the equivalent thing here. So of course it's going to be these two points here that'll be that'll be used. This one and this one. Now, because these two petals, which are, of course, are the equivalent of these ones, because these two, I extended them all the way into the middle, I'm now going to do the equivalent thing with the top and the bottom petal. So I'm going to um, extend this into the center, like so. Um, the psychoanalyst Carl Jung, he often talked about uh, the use of mandalas in, um, in healing and the way in which people would almost go into a spontaneous sort of self-healing by drawing uh, fourfold, often fourfold mandalas. And uh, you may be finding as you draw more of these patterns that there is something very relaxing and integrating about reminding yourself of this mathematical harmony. Now let's move um, to this area of the paper here. I think it'd just be nice to leave that one with the curved lines. We don't need to put any straight lines into there. Now this one, you probably need your ruler to be, let me see, I'll just move this up a bit. Have your ruler so it's about nine centimeters from the bottom of the page. So the point of my compasses is, is, is around about nine centimeters up from the bottom of the page. And, um, and about the same from this edge of the page. Now this, I, I don't know, this is like the most basic fundamental grid that we draw in geometry, this thing of six circles around one. <coughs> uh, I never tire of it. it. It's so beautiful and so simple. And uh, we often make a symbolic connection um, 
with uh, the six days of creation because you naturally have these six circles that fit around a seventh central circle. Now, the way that I'm drawing this, I'm seeing this as the central circle, the first one that we drew. And then the second circle I drew from uh, the top, the top point of that first circle. Now, as you can see, what I've done, I've moved to where the two circles intersect here on the right. And that's where I'm going to draw the next circle from. Now, each new circle that I draw on is going to give me the next position to draw from on my central circle. So I've now moved to here. And I'm going to keep on following this same simple plan. And you remember I pointed out a, a pink six fold flower uh, when I was showing the slides and I said that we'd be drawing something very similar to this. Um, it's that uh, type of flower, which we see a very uh, familiar image of in this drawing. Now, as you can see, as I draw each new circle, there's a floral form beginning to appear in the middle. I remember I pointed out the Star of David's uh, shape in uh, the daffodil, the six pointed star. We can now draw one of those onto this particular grid of six circles around one. Now the two triangles, you remember there was one triangle pointing up and one triangle pointing down. I'm actually going to turn it sideways so that there's one triangle uh, pointing to the right, as it were, and uh, another triangle pointing to the left. So I'm going to draw this line in first between here and here, and it should, you should find it just naturally passes through these two points, it's sort of similar to, to the triangle that we did a few minutes ago. Now, when we draw the very complicated uh, Islamic patterns, people are often surprised when they become aware that all of those straight lines that you find in a lot of the patterns um, are actually derived from intersecting circles. So that, um, that harmony of the circle that I was talking about at the very beginning, you could say that that is underlying all of that complexity of patterns as the simple uh, just uh, equality of the circle. So we've traced out threeness um, and then fourness. Now fivefoldness requires just a bit more commitment, a bit more time. So I'm not going to do that in today's session, but in the sessions that uh, I teach at the Prince's School, um, there'll be lots of fivefold symmetry in those classes. So having moved from five onto six, um, seven is very obscure. That's one that we uh, put in sometimes, but I'm going to move on to 
uh, eightfold symmetry, which of course is the doubling of four. So what we're going to do is going to bear some similarity to this diagram, but we're going to end up turning it into a straight line star shape. So let's uh, do a, a similar thing in terms of having the same radial measurements as we've used for uh, the other patterns that we've done so far. Again, I'm going to put my ruler so that I'm coming up nine centimeters from the bottom of the page and a similar sort of distance from here. Now you'll recognize uh, the first, the opening part of this um, of this pattern from what we did here. So I'm going to put in um, these two circles, one from the eastern point and one from the western point of the first circle that we've drawn. Now this time, rather than putting in a petal shape here, I'm actually just going to put in, I suppose, the tip of the petal. So I'm going to put in a little, actually a little cross shape. So just a little mark from here, and then an equivalent mark from here. Now don't worry if your cross is a bit bigger than my one, it's, it's not a big issue, as long as you have the actual point where the two lines cross. That's the main thing that we're looking for with what we're doing here. Now I'm going to do the equivalent thing to what I've got here down below from these two points. Now you may remember when we put in the two petals at the top and the bottom of this one, we then used them to put in this vertical line. And that's essentially what I'm going to do here now with these two crosses. I'm going to use the intersection points of those lines that form the crosses to put in this vertical line. And then similar to what we did in this one, I'm going to now use the northern circle, which I'm drawing now, and the southern circle. To give me what's known as a quatrefoil. So to get these four circles, I just simply used north, south, east and west on the initial circle. Now quatrefoil literally means four leaves. So foil as in foliage and quatra of course um, being the Latin word for four. Now, bearing in mind that four, uh, when doubled, is eight, so of course we're going to use the fourfold symmetry to divide the circle into eight. Now, the axis that comes about from linking up these two opposite petal points, as you can see, is going to divide this quarter of the circumference in half. So that would then give us 
the points that we need to divide the circle up into eight. So I'm going to do one here and one here. And then I'll do an equivalent thing like so. One here and one here. Now, having got these four points here, I'm now going to use them to draw four more circles. Now there is a, a straight line shape that we can draw onto this grid of circles, but because we're a bit restricted in time, there's just under 10 minutes left. I want us to do a slightly larger pattern based on 12. So I'll leave this one and turn the paper over. Now we need to have a larger radial measurement for this one. So if you're working in uh, imperial, it would be two inches, or if you're working in metric, around five centimeters. I'm going to place the point of the compasses in uh, the middle of the page. If you want, you can put your ruler between the top and the bottom of the page so that you can find that midpoint. Now I'm going to do the grid that we did earlier, the six circles around one. And then from there, we'll move on to doing another six circles so that we have 12 around one. This would be quite a nice way to finish, giving us a sort of rose pattern or a camellia pattern. Now I'm going to place the point of my compasses in the top to begin. And as we did a little earlier, I'm going to just work my way around that central circle. Each new circle that I draw on gives me the next position to draw from. Now you'll notice that these petals, these six petals, there's one pointing up and one pointing down, and then these others are diagonal. So we don't have one pointing uh, in the east or one pointing in the west. But what we're going to do is essentially the same six around one, but we're going to draw from a midpoint. We're going to begin from here. So I'm going to place my ruler like this, 
along those, so these intersection points, and then I can place this mark in, that's all we need. And I'm gonna go through the same procedure of six circles around one. So where this circle that I'm drawing now, where it crosses the central circle, that's what I'm gonna use next. Now I'm not gonna to go to here where there's a full petal because we've already used that point. I'm gonna to go to here where there's just a single line without its other line meeting it. So I'm gonna go into here. So even though this is the same as what we did before, it's just a little, we have to concentrate a bit more because there's a few more lines to negotiate, negotiate our way around. So again, having drawn from there, I'm gonna miss the full petal and go to this single line here. I mean, if you do go to one of the tips of the petals by accident, you'll just find that there's already a circle been drawn from there. So you'll know that you're at the wrong place. Now with the final one that you draw, you will find that you are going from a petal tip. And that gives you a, a wonderful image of something rather a uh, camellia like, which is a, a wonderful flower. Now, if you're feeling uh, adventurous and uh, you want to put something else onto this pattern, what you can do if you put, first of all, straight lines through these very slim petal shapes, so that would be a straight line going all the way through, through the center and through the opposing slim petal, straight lines through all of those. And then after that, in all of these gaps you have, so for instance, here's a gap, you'd link up the intersection points and that would give you a diamond, like so and you'd have a diamond here as well. And once you've done all of those diamond shapes in all of these petals, then you could also do another diamond shape here. So as long as you follow the intersections, in each case, the four intersections, you'll get a diamond. Then here you'll get, well, that'll actually be a square, believe it or not, if you use those four points. So that's the next orbit out. And then there'll be another diamond shape when you get to this stage. And of course, these are you know going all the way around. And you can get yourself a rather beautiful straight line version of this pattern. But um, this one is beautiful enough if you just want to leave it like this. OK, well, thanks for coming to this drawing session. And uh, do come for more drawing classes at uh, the Princess Foundation School of Traditional Arts. Uh, this one has been a very simple, basic one. Uh, we go uh, everything from very simple things like this all the way up to very complex uh, pattern making. So uh, do come and join us for some more.